Hello, Winnemucca Wolves. Hope you're having a great day. All right, we're going to start chapter two of the Zodiac Legacy Convergence. Chapter two. Stephen took a step forward into the darkness. He blinked, waiting for his eyes to adjust. Then he stopped short. The floor dropped off just ahead of him, descending into a long stairway. It was made of wood with a creaky old railing beside it. The walls were worn metal, stained and weathered by time. Stephen sucked in a breath. The air was stale and quiet. Whatever this place is, he thought, it's a lot older than this museum. Once again, he hesitated. He leaned forward, but he couldn't see more than a few steps down. There was no way to tell where it went or how far down it stretched. Suddenly, the scream rang out again, deep and resonant. Stephen pulled out his phone. Shining it like a weak flashlight, he started down the staircase. The steps sagged under his feet, and the railing felt like it might snap off in his hand. The light from his phone illuminated a few steps at a time, but that was all. So he couldn't see the door anymore, either. I'm headed deep underground, Stephen thought. But sideways, too? I think we're going away from the museum? The scream rose to a high pitch and then went silent again. Stephen tried to keep track of how far he traveled, but he hadn't thought to start counting steps at the beginning, and now it was impossible to tell where he was. Oh! Stephen cried as he stumbled, reaching the staircase's abrupt end. Something lay at his feet, crumpled in a shapeless lump. For a terrible moment, he thought it was a body. Grimacing, afraid to look, he leaned down and touched it. Whew! With relief, he realized it was just a pile of cloth, a uniform, like the ones worn by the guides at the museum. Something sharp pricked his finger, and he felt a small, hard object pinned to the uniform. Wincing, he lifted the object. It was a name tag. Jumaine! A million thoughts raced through Stephen's brain. Had the guide changed clothes down here for some reason, hastily tossing her old uniform aside? Had she been attacked? The stairwell was still dark, but Stephen's eyes were starting to adjust. Just ahead, a metal door loomed at the end of the passageway. He tossed the clothing aside and felt around until his hand closed over a doorknob. For a moment, he thought about turning and running back up the stairs. Then he glanced at the discarded uniform crumpled on the floor. His heart skipped a beat. If somebody's in trouble. He pushed open the door and stepped forward. Then he gasped. Stephen stood on a thin catwalk running all the way around a large, perfectly circular room. The room was dark, lit only slightly from the floor below. Stephen realized that the catwalk, frighteningly, didn't have a railing. He stepped forward carefully, peering over the edge. Ten or twelve feet below, a dozen round circles were arrayed around the edges of the chamber, each about the size of a wading pool. And here's the picture. Looking closer, he noticed they actually were pools. Filled with some strange shimmering liquid, they radiated a pale, eerie, greenish light into the room. The room was quiet. If someone had been screaming in here, they'd stopped now. Stephen looked up. The chamber stretched far upward, several stories high. Its walls were made of metal and tapered, narrowing toward the ceiling like an upside-down ice cream cone. This gave the room a claustrophobic feel, despite its immense size. Round holes and old support struts dotted the walls, as if other catwalks had once been mounted there and then been removed. And at the top, at the narrow top of the chamber where the walls covered almost to a point, a large flat disc had been mounted on the ceiling. It looked very old, and on its visible side facing down, it was marked with a very familiar set of numbers and boxes. That's the, what was it called? The Shippan! Stephen realized. The exhibit from upstairs, the one that had been removed for repairs. The one that looks like grandfather's little compass. Stephen sucked in a deep breath. What was going on? What was this room anyway? 
What were those mysterious pools of liquid and why had valuable exhibit from the museum been installed in such a bizarre place? And how did the mysterious Jumaine fit in? In the exact center of the room, a group of lights winked on. Stephen blinked and saw a small elevated stage with three, with three people standing on it. The stage was covered with computers, monitors, technical equipment, all rigged up in crazy tangle of wires and cables. The people wore baggy jumpsuits and held clipboards and tablet computers. One of them, a serious looking technician with thin glasses, looked up away from Stephen. Sorry, Maxwell, he called out. Just a minor power glitch. Stephen followed the technician's gaze. Partway across the room, a large figure hovered in midair. He was lit from below by one of the pools, so Stephen couldn't make out his features, but his body was coiled. His fists clenched. The pool below him seemed to glow slightly brighter than the others, casting long, imposing shadows along his body. When the man, Maxwell, spoke, his voice was deep and commanding. Is it repaired now? he asked. Yes, sir, the technician replied. Maxwell reached out a hand and pointed to another pool. Now Stephen could see. Maxwell was astride a one-person hover vehicle, sort of crazy, higher-tech version of a Segway. And around Maxwell's outstretched arm, around his entire body, in fact, a greenish glow radiated, a fainter version of the glow from the pools below. Then proceed, Maxwell said. And Carlos? The technician cocked his head. He seemed agitated, even a bit fearful. <clears throat> I'm counting on you, Maxwell finished. Carlos nodded. He cast a nervous glance around the chamber from the compass on the roof down to the sides to the catwalk. His eyes almost met Stephen. For a moment, Stephen was afraid Carlos had spotted him. Hang on just a sec, guys. There was somebody using a leaf blower. Too loud. Anyway, thank you for that commercial interruption. Uh, where'd we go? Where'd we go? Oh, he cast a nervous glance around the chamber from the compass on the roof down to the sides of the catwalk. His eyes almost met Stephen's, and for a moment, Stephen was afraid Carlos had spotted him. Then Carlos turned away issuing a series of orders to the other techs. The three technicians consulted a bank of monitors, their eyes darting quickly from screen to screen. Upper stems look good, Carlos said. Lower branches, slight blockage and, blockage and branch two. On it, said a female tech, flushing the branch now. Chi levels returning to normal. Steve pressed his back against the wall of the chamber, shaking his head. What are they talking about? All systems nominal, Carlos turned back toward the hovering figure. Maxwell, we're ready for position three. No, Maxwell replied, his voice booming through the chamber. Position six, Carlos grimaced. I told you, I want the strongest powers first. When Carlos hesitated, Maxwell swiveled his hover vehicle to face the stage. Maxwell's eyes glowed a fierce, angry green and a spasm of pain seemed to pass through him. Carlos, Maxwell said, your knowledge of the convergence had, has gotten us this far. I am grateful, and I would prefer that you complete the procedure. His voice grew cold, but if necessary, I can bring in someone else. Carlos shook his head quickly and returned to his work. Maxwell turned away without a word and glided across the center of the chamber. He came to a stop just above another pool, a few spaces closer to Stephen. I've got a slight fire deficit, said another male technician. I see it, Carlos said. Maria, shunt some wood on energy over to the branch five. What? the woman asked. That'll overload the whole branch. Right, uh, my mistake, Carlos said. I meant branch four, chi levels compensated. Activating Shaipan now. A whirring noise filled the room. Stephen looked up at the source, the Shaipan. The ancient astrological disk mounted on the narrow ceiling. A large bright light flashed on. 
one of twelve lamps mounted around the shy pan's outer edge. The spotlight stabbed straight onto the ground. The other eleven lamps ranged around the edge of the shy pan were dark. Alignment sequences go, a female technician said. With a loud grinding sound, the shy pan began to swivel slowly in place. As it moved, the spotlight traveled along the floor between the pools. Except Stephen, Stephen saw now it wasn't a floor at all. It was dirt, ordinary soil. That meant the pools haven't, hadn't been brought into the museum after it was constructed. The pools were already here sunken deep in this strange chamber beneath the earth. The museum had been constructed above them. Stephen drew in another deep breath. What is this place? The shy pan ground to a halt directly above Maxwell's hovering figure. Its light shone straight down and around him, focused directly on the pool beneath his feet. Maxwell floated between the disk above and the pool below, caught between the two sources of unnatural radiance. Then Stephen noticed something else strange. Something, someone, was creeping along the ground. In the darkness at the edge of the room, a slim, lithe figure darting from one pool to another, moving closer to Maxwell's position. Stephen couldn't see the figure clearly. It was keeping in the shadows. But something about the shadow's motion reminded him of the last time he'd seen Jumani, the tour guide, and she'd crossed the exhibit hall to the door. That's her he thought. I know it. Maxwell glanced up at the shy pan, then down at the luminous pool. His fists clenched open and closed on the handles of his hover vehicle. He seemed to be bracing himself for something. Resume convergence, he said. Position six. On the central stage, Carlos pointed a finger at the female technician. She tapped out a command on her screen. On the underside of the shy pan, the spotlight surged brighter. Energy crackled across the surface of the disk, pulsing and gathering. At the same time, directly below Maxwell, the pool erupted with light. When the energy from above met the blazing liquid shooting up from below, Maxwell screamed. It was a deep, soul-chilling sound. Stephen recognized it immediately as the scream he'd heard upstairs in the museum, and then again in the stairwell. It sounds, he thought, as if... Someone is being ripped out of his body. And then he realized, no, it's more like something's being forced into him. Something foreign, alien. The energy flared, forming a vertical column. Maxwell's body became a silhouette, a twitching mass still clinging to its high-tech hover, hover machine. Something else started to form, a second figure rearing and bucking in the energy glow above Maxwell, a raging beast, a creature of pure energy, wild and untamed. As Stephen stared into the glow, the beast coalesced into a huge, wild stallion, its mouth open wide and its mane whipped back and forth in a breathtaking display of silent savagery. Stephen glanced over at the control cage. Carlos and the other technicians stood watching Maxwell with clinical, scientific eyes. Carlos flinched slightly just once when Maxwell's scream, when Maxwell's scream rose to a deafening pitch. Stephen cast a look down at the corner of the room again, but the tour guide had vanished. If she was still here, she must be hiding deep in the shadows. The energy flared once again. Maxwell raised his head to the heavens and howled even louder, more savagely than before. Then all at once, the energy was gone. The shy pan went dark. The liquid splashed back down to the pool. The glow flashed and faded around Maxwell, taking the ethereal stallion vision with it. On the control stage, the technicians rushed around, manipulating touch screen, control, touch screen controls. The woman began to speak, but Carlos motioned her to silence. All three of them turned to stare at their leader. Maxwell still hovered in midair, wobbling slightly. He glowed more brightly than before, like a coal that had been heated in a fire. Green energy leaked from his eyes, his mouth, his fingertips. Liquid from the pool dripped off of him, drying rapidly. Slowly, he looked up, staring just past Stephen. His head swiveled to face 
to control stage. Then he smiled and spoke a single word. Horse, he said. And that is the end of chapter two. Join us tomorrow as we finish our book.